All right, good morning. How are we doing today? Man, awesome. What a great day to be together, amen? Man, I love, I love Sundays. I just love the chance to come together. It says a family and uh, strengthen ourselves in Jesus. And uh, man, get ready to get out there this week and uh, be the, the hands and feet, the light of the gospel, amen? Amen. Uh, hey, if you haven't been with us, uh, we've been in a teaching series uh, called Rethinking Church. And uh, today we start uh, part seven. And I'm sure many of you are wondering, man, how long is this guy going to keep teaching on this? Well, uh, you know, uh, until we start getting it, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, right? We'll just start repeating uh, some of the past messages. No, uh, but, uh, you know, I, it's been a, um, I, hope, I hope it's been beneficial to you, and I hope it's been challenging. It's, it's been certainly challenging to me um, in just the, the preparation time and um, looking at what the, the very first church uh, in the book of Acts was all about. Um, not, not just so much how they were structured or set up, but, but the things that mattered most to them. And it, it you know, has caused me to, to ask a lot of, of questions of myself and um, questions, that, you know, about our church and, you know, like, like what are the things that matter most to us? And, and um, is, there, is there a chance that, that perhaps over time, you know, the church has, has kind of become focused on things that it shouldn't, shouldn't have ever become focused on? Is, is, there, is there a chance that over time throughout history, throughout the years that have gone by, that the church has become distracted by things that it never should have become distracted by? And so the, the whole, I guess, point of this series, if you haven't been with us, has just been to, to rethink church a little bit, you know, not to, not to allow our, uh, you know, our, our experiences, uh, good or bad, to be the sole definition of, of what church is to us, but, but maybe to look at the Bible <laughs> and let the Bible define it for us, of what, what the church is meant to be about. And, and, and maybe, you know, after all of this, as a church, we could take that big step together of, of making sure that we are about the right things, making sure that we're committed to the right things, that we're focused on the right things, and, and, uh, and, and, and that ultimately, w- whether we, we grow big or don't grow big or, you know, whatever, whatever success tends to look like in most people's eyes, um, that success to us will be defined by being a church that Jesus is proud of, uh, being, being a church that he can smile upon. And, and that's what matters most to me. And when I pray, I pray like that. God, could we just be a church that, that, that you're proud of, that you, you would smile upon, um, because underneath it all, we're just committed to the right things. And I think that that's what you see in that very first century church, right? And you, 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 see, a, you see a church that um, was, 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 was incredible. And, and I guess maybe one of the big takeaways for me in this whole process has, has been that, that when I look at the church and I read about the church, you know, in the first century, it seems to me that the church was always meant to be irresistible, a community of people that were meant to be irresistible. I mean, if you think about what, what mattered most to them, you know, they, they were to, to love God, they were to love others, and, and love their enemies. I mean, it was pretty basic, right? And I mean, a community like that, who, who would, who would, you know, not want to be a part of that. I mean, even if you don't agree with Jesus and even if you don't agree with our theology and what we, you know, what we believe, I mean, certainly a community like that would, would be an irresistible community, you would think. And yet, maybe the troubling, you know, thought through it all has, has been that it seems to me that the church has become quite resistible instead of irresistible. It seems like over time, we've, we've become a, a, you know, a, a, a structure, an institution that, that people just uh, resist uh, completely. And uh, Pastor Josh mentioned that, you know, a few weeks ago when he talked about why we need the church and about how people have a bad experience with one church and they just throw it all away. And it seems to me that so many people just resist the church. Jim Tomberlin, I told you the statistic last week, he says that 80% of churches in America are, are either plateaued or in decline. And that is a, um, an, an alarming statistic. And I think the reason why, you know, I, I, I'm um, maybe troubled by it the most is that it's not surprising. It's not a surprising statistic when you think of churches in America and how many of them are really healthy, how many of them really have like, like the right priorities and, and exist for the right things. And so um, I want us to, to, to just, just begin to, uh, you know, rethink this thing and make sure that we're a part of, of, uh, of the church that Jesus wants to build here on earth. Amen? Um, and, so, and so 2,000 years ago, we believe that the church began as a movement. It didn't begin as an institution. It didn't begin as a religion, right? It did not begin as this Christianity, uh, worldwide, global religion. Uh, we believe that it began as a movement. 
and that it was always intended to be a movement, that it was never intended to become a religion or an institution or a building or a steeple or a beautiful place with stained glass and, and, and hymnals, but that it was always meant to be a, a movement, and that 2,000 years ago, uh, a bunch of people who loved Jesus and witnessed his resurrection, 120 of them on the day of Pentecost, uh, spilled into the streets of Jerusalem with that very crazy message that Jesus came back to life, that he was the risen Christ, that he was the son of the living God, and they began to tell anybody that would listen that Jesus had come back to life and that they should put their faith, their hope in him. And within a month, there were 5,000 men who had agreed to this notion, who had agreed to this idea, who had said, yes, uh, I, I believe that Jesus really is the Messiah, and so you count women and children, and the number within just the very first month was pretty large. And this movement was just picking up steam. It was just beginning. Uh, and yet uh, all these people coming to Jesus in the city of Jerusalem, uh, it was causing quite the uproar, as you could imagine. You know, you think of the, you know, we don't know exactly the size of the city of Jerusalem back then, but that's a lot of people in the city of Jerusalem. That's a, that's a, that's a, good, a good percentage of the people who, who are turning to Jesus. And, uh, it, and so the, the delicate balance of power that existed between the rulers in Rome and the rulers in the temple of Jerusalem was, was becoming disturbed. Because the rulers in Rome, they had sort of given permission to the, to the leaders of the, of the temple in Jerusalem, given them permission to sort of kind of do whatever they wanted, as long as they would exert control over the people. And so you can see the tension and the struggle where this delicate balance of power is being disrupted uh, because now in Jerusalem there's this uprising. There's these people who, who can't be controlled by the rulers of the temple. And, and so, the, so the, you know, they're not really sure what to do and ha how to handle this. And so the leaders in Rome and the leaders in Jerusalem began to, to resist completely this uprising, this group of people, the, these, these early Christians who didn't even go by Christians back then, they, 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 went by, uh, they were known as, as followers of the way. Uh, and, so, uh, and so they began to be resisted. Many of them would be flogged, be beaten, they'd be thrown in jail. Right? Some of them would give their own lives. In fact, we talked a couple weeks ago about Stephen. He was the first martyr in the history of the church. First person to ever give his life for the name of Jesus. And uh, I mean, what a remarkable person what, what a remarkable story, uh, as, as we think back a couple weeks ago, of what he actually did. And, and, and so many people, right, over the history of, of the church have given their lives for the name of Jesus. And what we find is that when Stephen uh, was stoned to death, that it actually ignited this, uh, um, this full-scale persecution against the church that raged for years and years and years and years. And during the, the first three years of, the, of, the, of, the, of this persecution that existed against the church, the, the like, chief enemy number one was a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And we would, we would come, uh, you know, he, so chief persecutor, right, who would have a, an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus uh, a, a, three years into persecuting the church, and we, we would become the man that we affectionately know as the Apostle Paul. Right, who, who would write so much of the New Testament, who would evangelize so much of the known world, would reach Gentiles, people who, who were not Jewish. He would, he would make the gospel of Jesus known and available to, to, to non-Jewish people. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the reason why you and I even know the name of Jesus today was because of what he did. And so, um, and so Paul really, you can show, show this first slide. Paul, we showed this last week, but he, he began to, to uh, he left Jerusalem and began to kind of, to spread throughout the entire Mediterranean realm, planting church after church after church. Little ecclesias or little gatherings of people, right? We, we defined that in week one, what an ecclesia was. and It, it wasn't this, this building. The church wasn't a building, but it was a gathering of people. It was, um, it, it was meant to be a community. And, and so he would show up in these cities and he would start church after church after church, leaving from Jerusalem. 47 AD is when he, when he began on his first missionary journey, and, and incredible things took place, right? If you weren't here last week, get caught up. We talked a lot about his, his ministry and what he did um, in, in, in those years and, and how he ended up ultimately dying for his faith in Jesus Christ up in Rome uh, in, uh, in 60, 67 AD. While Paul was out on his first missionary journey, 47 AD is when he started, about a year, year and a half into it. Um, meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, Right over here, the, the first major controversy was brewing uh, in the history of the church. The, the, you, ever, you, ever, you ever been a part of or experienced church controversy? Right? No, nobody, right? Probably in this place. Uh, what is that? So, uh, ever? But, right, it's not anything new. Church controversy, like it's been around since, since uh, really the beginning, it seems like. And so, 
um, this controversy was starting to brew, the very first one, and, and I, I think of it as, as a controversy that has continued to resurface time and time and time again throughout the history of the church. Um, it seems as if the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, this church back there, right, which is sort of the hub of Christianity at the time, later the hub of Christianity would somehow uh, relocate to Rome and, where, the, and, and, you know, um, where Vatican City is now. Uh, for, for a lot of people, that's where they view as the hub of Christianity. And, uh, but, but the leaders in Jerusalem would struggle over this question. They would wrestle over this question of basically how good does a person have to be to be a part of the church? And, and who is the church for? And, and you know, um, how do you become a part of this thing? How holy do you have to be? How much of your lifestyle do you have to clean up in order to be accepted into the church? And, and to be a follower of Jesus, what does that really mean in terms of your lifestyle and changing your behavior and all of these things? And these were the, the things they were wrestling with. How good does a person really have to be to be a part of the church? And so in Acts chapter 15, that's where, that's where we see the very first place that religion, this idea of religion, um, begins to work its way into uh, the movement that we've, we've learned to define as the church. And what you see, I think, throughout history, if, if, you, if you care to ever read about the history of the church, and there is so much, it's so much good for us as Christians to, to, to learn um, that you don't even read about in Scripture. Uh, but, but from when Scripture ended, right, the story of the church ended in Scripture to, to now, uh, what has really taken place uh, throughout the last 2,000 years for just you and I to know about Jesus Christ. I mean, the miracle in and of itself for the message of Jesus to escape the first century when that church was under so much persecution is a miracle. And, uh, and it's something that we should really hold dear to ourselves. Uh, throughout history, the church has always seemed to struggle with this idea of how good does a person really have to be? This idea of religion. It's always been something that's kind of weaved its way into the church somehow, some way. Uh, the, the, the tendency to sort of move away from, from being a movement and a community and a family and, 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 and towards this, this organized religion. And, uh, and, and so throughout history, the church has always drifted. It seems like they've always struggled with, with drifting towards becoming a religion and away from becoming a family. They've always seemed to sort of drift um, towards becoming a religion and away from becoming a community, towards emphasizing religion, 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 and, and, and not much emphasis on a relationship with Jesus Christ. And over time, that's sort of become the, the, the big idea. And the problem with that is that religion, as it's like... You know, as you pull it out of the New Testament, the word used there and, and, and define it in the, in the Greek, the, the word religion really means to return to bondage. Did you know that? The, isn't that that's, it's like an incredible thought, isn't it? That, that the word religion actually means to return to bondage. And what I think is, is interesting about that definition is that it, 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 it's not saying, you know, that you're, you know, discovering bondage or stepping into a new type of bondage, but, but it says to return to bondage. It means that, that you're returning to what you've already been set free from. That that's what religion really is in the church. And so we find throughout history that the church has struggled with, with being who it's meant to be, with, with keeping its identity uh, in, in what it's, it's supposed to be a part of. And they've always struggled with returning back to some of the things that it, that it was set free from, some of the things that it didn't have to exist for any longer. And so if you're writing notes today, write this, this big thought down. Religion will always focus on issues of preference over issues of substance. Think about that for a second here. Religion always focuses on issues of preference over issues of substance. Right, so there's all sorts of churches, all kinds of churches, all different flavors, right? Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors, there's all kinds, right? There's all sorts of flavors of churches out there. You can find, you know, whatever flavor you're looking for, and, and that's part of the beauty of the church uh, globally, and it's part of the challenge of the church globally. How do we all get along? How do we stay united in our purpose, right? But, uh, but as you look at, 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 uh, at, at, at religion and the, the challenge of when it starts to infiltrate and weave its way into the church is that it focuses on issues of preference over issues of substance. So, so, so you think about, you know, when controversy has ever risen in a church that you've, you've experienced this or, or, or maybe you, you've, you've struggled at times, you know, throughout your life. You've been in a church and you've just been like, man, I, I'm really struggling with this. And, and ask yourself right now, you know, have those issues been over issues of preference or issues of substance? And that's when religion really starts to grab a hold of the church. Um, what, what, what's the big deal here? 
What are we, are we struggling over the fact that like, you know, pastors wear, wear jeans on stage? Or are we struggling, you know, have you heard that one before? I've heard that before. Um, not here. This is a great, you know, other churches, right? A little more stuffy churches, but ours is great. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you hear those things, you know. Uh, I remember uh, being in a church where there was like controversy over the color of the carpet. You know, you've probably heard me even, you know, bring that example up over the last few weeks. But that's because it's a real example in my life, you know. Like what color is the carpet going to be? Well, that's an issue of preference, right? That's not an issue of substance, and, and when I look at the history of the church, you know, I, I think it makes perfect sense why this type of controversy would exist. Because the Jewish Christians, right, Jewish people, I mean, that's their nationality and their religion. You've got to understand that. People in Jerusalem, right, it's not there anymore. The people in Jerusalem, these are Jewish Christians. They've come to, to faith in Jesus Christ. And they, they have... Uh, uh, you know, converted, I guess, to, to the way. Jewish Christians, you got to think about how they have been raised and how they have been brought up. And they grew up in a religious system that required them to keep 613 laws, including the Ten Commandments. Now you think of the religious system they grew up in, and that was, that was the, uh, the goal for everybody, was to keep every single law in, in the Jewish religious system. 613 laws. That's a lot. I mean, you, we think, you know, the Ten Commandments is hard enough, you know, like, uh, and, and they had to keep, you know, 613 of them. And, and so what you find here in, in, in the, the first century church in Acts 15 is that they're really trying to bring their old way of life into their new way of life. They're trying to sort of merge this old religious Jewish system with all of these laws into this new faith in Jesus Christ that's all about grace and forgiveness, they believed that Christianity, or the way, was an extension of Judaism because Jesus, in their mind, was their Jewish Messiah. And so, and so the confusion amongst these, these first century Jewish Christians was, was that, you know, he's our fulfillment of, of the prophecy of the Messiah, and, and we grew up Jewish, and so they, they began to sort of blend everything together. It became kind of this, this, this mess, very confusing. Their assumption was, was that to become a follower of Jesus, first you had to become a follower of Moses, basically. That first you had to become Jewish before you could become Christian. And you, so you can see the hurdle, right? You can see the challenge. Slow that back up there. You can, you can see the, the, the challenge of, of the, the church in Jerusalem sort of wrestling over these issues while all of these Gentile churches, non-Jewish people, are getting saved set free as Paul is, is, is evangelizing these cities and, and he's telling them a very simple message that you come to Jesus through, through grace and forgiveness of sins, through faith, and, and yet there's this tension in Jerusalem that, that maybe it's not as simple as that. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus really explains what he set out to do. It says, then Jesus said to them, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now, that, that sounds good to us. Like, I, we want to, all of us want to walk a little lighter, right? All of us want to live lighter. We want, we want to, we, we want that. We carry, we carry burdens with us, uh, you know, all the time. But what is Jesus really speaking of here? When he's referring to the yoke, that his yoke is easy to bear, he's speaking of the burden of all the requirements laid out in the Old Testament law. He says with the, that with his way, the burden is so much easier to bear. That it's not these, these 613 laws, but that it's so much easier than that. And, and, and so you have, you have this message right here that Paul is teaching everybody. Everybody around the Mediterranean realm, he's teaching them that, that, that to become saved, it's so simple. It's all about grace and forgiveness. And this is where the controversy began because the, the Jerusalem council in, in, in Jerusalem, the, the Jerusalem council um, basically said it's not as simple as that. It, it, there has to be more to Christianity and to becoming saved than just that. First, you know, you got to memorize some things. Like all Jewish boys, right, that, 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 would, that would grow up in their culture, had to memorize the entire Torah, Matthew, Mark, Nope, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? That's the Torah. Uh, and, and they had to memorize everything, you know, from beginning to end. 
you know, first you got to memorize some things. You got to maybe jump through some hoops. They wanted to, to kind of, you know, make sure these people, you know, really knew what they were signing up for. You got to clean up your act, and then you can embrace Jesus, and then maybe you can become a church person. Started to put all these requirements on these Gentile believers who were turning to the faith. And, and uh, in, in, in the first century church, many good intentioned followers of Jesus uh, were taking the purity of the gospel and they were poisoning it with religion. The beauty and the simplicity of the gospel and they're poisoning it with religion. If there was anything causing spiritual sickness in the first century church, confusion in the, in the first century church, it was religion. And you'll see that here in Acts chapter 15, um, starting in verse 1, you find the controversy about how good does a person have to be really to be a part of the church, and, and it, it gets defined here. But what, we, what we're going to read about is, is one of the most significant meetings that's ever taken place in the history of the church called the Jerusalem Council. And this is where they clearly defined um, as as you know, leaders and, and apostles, right, the, the disciples who would become the leaders of the church, the apostles. This is where Peter stands up. You know, uh, many Catholics believe in him to be the first pope of the church. I mean, he's a big deal. You know, James, the brother of Jesus, stands up and speaks. And, and uh, this is where they define what it really means to be a follower of Jesus and what you have to do uh, to be a Christian and to be a part of the church. And so it says here in verse 1, while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this term, uh, pretty high standard, right? Uh, circumcision equates somehow to salvation. Uh, that's a pretty high standard. Salvation by surgery. Uh, could you imagine? I mean, that sounds so bizarre to us. Um, basically, what that means is, is they're saying you have to become Jewish first before you can become a Christian. Because circumcision was, was a huge part of the Jewish faith, right? That, that every Jewish boy would become circumcised at, at, at a young age. And so um, they're basically saying that to all these Gentiles everywhere around the Mediterranean realm, that if you want to become a follower of Jesus, first you have to become Jewish. First you have to abide by the law. First, you have to follow all the Jewish customs and the 613 laws that we follow as Jewish men and women, and then you can embrace Jesus Christ. I mean, could you imagine, um, you know, like, like their new membership class would have been like all uh, women and children, right? Pretty much. Can you imagine like, like that, a new covenant member class, like uh, all the husbands are like out in the car, like, hey, babe, you go ahead, you know, uh, go, go for it, um, so you think about like whatever was ridiculous, you know, for your church somewhere to, 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 you know, disagree over or argue over. Like it doesn't really compare to this. You know, this is like a, like a, like a pretty major thing, uh, you know. And so you think of like the different controversies maybe all of us have experienced throughout the years. And you go, man, that's such a small, that's small potatoes. This is a big, big deal. Um, here, here's the point. You can write this down too. There has always been this tendency for the church to drift towards becoming insider focused. Right? We we uh we could you could see the struggle like even just sometimes in our church. I mean it's these are the people you see. These are the people, you know, like, like this is our church. This is, this is who we are. And it, there's always been this struggle, this tendency throughout time for the church to, to, to drift towards focusing on, on the insiders, the ones who are already here. You know, Christianity then has to, like, look like us, right? So the way, the way Christianity looks like for us has to look like that for, for other people. If you want to join us, you have to look the part. You have to do what we do, and this is exactly what's happening in Acts chapter 15. It says here in verse 2, it says, Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, right, over the circumcision being, being the way to salvation, uh, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question, right? So, so it starts in Antioch, which is, which is a you know, humongously important church in the, in, in the history of, of Christianity. And in fact, that's, that's the place where the term Christian or Christianity first, first was used. And, uh, and so that's where like, this is starting to, to spread, you know, this, this kind of false gospel. So Paul and Barnabas um, are, are invited to Jerusalem to, to discuss all of this. Um, 
the church, verse three, the church sent uh, the delegates to Jerusalem and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them much to everyone's joy that the Gentiles too were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Paul, or Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them, but then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. I'm going I'm to read verse 5 again, the first part. It says, But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted. Now, this seems to me like an, like an oxymoron, like, like believers who were Pharisees. But that's what Scripture tells us, that there were actually people who were Pharisees who became believers. The, 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 the party, like the political party, the religious political party that, that, that crucified Jesus, some of them actually uh, were compelled by this message that Jesus had come back to life, and many of them had actually uh, believed and, and, and had, had crossed over into Christianity but what you can see is that even though they're believing in Jesus, they're still struggling with, with, with you know, kind of the way life has always been, the, the religion and the law. And, and, and you can see that the struggle here as they stand up, these, these uh, believers who are Pharisees, and they insist that the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So 613 laws... And customs, right? So, so people, you know, how you eat, uh, how you dress, you have to like walk differently, you know? It's, it's like all of these customs, all of these laws. And, and you got to also have a surgery on top of that. It's, it's, a pretty, it's pretty significant. I mean, how long would it even take to learn all of those for a Gentile? I mean, they would die before they learned all of the, the laws probably. I mean, for a Gentile, you know, middle-aged man who finally, you know, found Jesus, uh, for him to learn and follow all of the 613 laws um, and, and go through um, surgery, I mean, he'd, he'd probably be a dead man by the time he got it all figured out. You can write this down. Religion will always reduce Christianity to a list of do's and don'ts. That's, that, that's, the, that's the, like why it's so toxic. Because religion starts, is all about like, like what you can do and what you can't do. And for a lot of people, that's been their experience of the church. That's been their experience of Christianity. That's been their experience of Jesus. That it's all about behavior modification. When really what we learned about in week one, that it, it's not about behavior modification. It's about heart change. It's about heart modification. It's about allowing Jesus to, to you know, have your entire life and not just a part of your life. And religion always reduces the significance of what Christianity is meant to be. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ that changes your life, the way you live, the way you think, the way you act, down to simply a list of do's and don'ts. In Galatians, Paul writes really to this, this same issue, to the church in Galatia. And uh, he's writing to this church because they're adding to the gospel, right? They're, they're adding that you gotta be circumcised to become a Christian. And so Paul writes to them this, this letter, and he says this. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to, to, to pervert the gospel of Christ. This is what's happening here in the first century. Think for a moment with me, again, about the miracle that the pure message of Jesus escaped the first century. When it, wasn't, when it was under persecution, and it was, uh, and, and it was also under you know, religious confusion as well. I love that part there. He says that some, some people are, are throwing you into confusion, trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. That word pervert uh, in the Greek, it's a Greek word called uh, metastrepho. It means to pervert, to corrupt, to distort, or to poison. Paul says this is what's happening in the gospel. It's being poisoned. This isn't the real gospel. He finds out what's going on, and he pins this letter, and, and he's so upset uh, because he sees people who are free from the law now returning to their old ways that they're mixing their old way of life with their new way of life. And this is, a, a, I think, an incredible challenge. And it's, again, it's not just an issue that, that surfaced back then. I think it's an issue that surfaces time and time and time again um, in the history of the church, and it's something we deal with in 2018. 
this, this challenge, this struggle of mixing our old way of life with our new way of life. Trying to, to have Jesus plus all these other things. And that's not the gospel. And that's not the, 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 the way Jesus intended this to, to really be. Acts chapter 15, as we, or Acts, uh, verse 7, says, At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as followers. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. Now catch this. He says, he says, God knows people's hearts. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers, catch this, with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Big idea right there. Big thought right there. The big problem with religion is that it focuses on the outside instead of the inside. That's the problem with religion. And that's how you see it in 2018, I think. As you see Christians, you see followers of Jesus putting more emphasis on what people see on the outside than on what God sees on the inside. The big idea of the movement that Jesus came to start was that the inside of a person carried much more significance than the outside of a person. Right? This, this, is, this is the significance of the gospel. It's the significance of what Jesus started, that what goes on inside of you carries more significance and carries more weight than what goes on outside of you that you could actually appear to be doing all things right and on the inside be doing all things wrong. This is why in, in Revelation chapter 3, right, as, as, as John is, is writing this, this vision he sees, in chapter 3 he starts to write to all of these, these seven churches. In, in the church of Sardis, what does he say? He says, you have this reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Like, that should alarm all of us, shouldn't it? That that's in the, in the, in the end times, the latter days, that there would be churches uh, like this, who appear to be alive, but on the inside they're dead. This was the challenge with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 24 when, when Jesus addressed them and he called them whitewashed tombstones, that they're all, they're all nice and pretty on the outside, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones. You see, Jesus and the message of Christ came to, 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 to focus us, to get us focused on this idea that, that the inside of a man carried more significance than the outside of a man. Religion will always try to get you to focus the other way around. Religion is really human effort to close the gap between man and God. It's, it's human effort. It's, you know, like, what you can do. But, you know, not, and not to be, not to be a, you know, a jerk about it, but you can't, you can't do anything. Like, none of us can. We're not, we're not good enough at all to try to close even an inch of the gap between us and God. And it is only through Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed on the cross that you and I have a chance at all. Acts chapter 15, uh, verse 19, so the story goes on, right? And it says this, it says, Peter's still speaking. Uh, James, actually, I'm sorry, James is speaking here, and he says, and so my judgment uh, is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. I love that part. We should, we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. <laughs> for these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. I love this, and I love that James um, says this. First of all, like, Regardless of, of what's really being taught here, if, if, if you ever needed proof for the fact that, that like, Jesus really was the Son of God, um, it would have to be the fact that his brother um, agreed to it, right? I mean, I mean could you imagine, like, 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 that's such a huge piece to the proof of Jesus, is that his own brother uh, acknowledged that, that he was the Son of God. Truly, he was the Son of God. I mean, I can imagine these disciples all getting together and being like, okay, James, tell us the scoop. What's the real scoop on Jesus, right? 
And, and like, like how, how much proof would James need to agree to the fact that his brother was the son of God? He'd need a lot of proof, I think. And I think that that's a lot of proof for us, that his own brother came and, uh, and, 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 and admitted to it and said that he was the son of God. And he's speaking here, and he's one of the, 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 the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. And he says that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. And you know what? This is why we exist as a church here at New Point. You know, this is why we exist. Our mission is to create a church where God is easy to find. That's, that's, that's what we're doing here. To not make it difficult for, God to find, for people to find God. To make it easy for people to find God. That has a lot to do with, with the presence of God being tangible in our church. Right, that it's, it's, it's not a stale, dying church. That's why we, we, we believe strongly in having like, a live worship, people who are actual passionate worshipers of Jesus. This is why we, we try to teach cha- challenging messages. This is why we try to be a, a, a friendly community because we want when people come here for, for it to be easy for them to find God. But when you look at the church in Jerusalem that day, way back then, and you think of some churches that have struggled with this issue of religion time after time after time over the years, these have been churches that have been very difficult for people to find God in. Because, because how much do I have to change? How much of my acts do I have to clean up before I can be accepted and before I can be loved by this community of followers? James tells them there's really, there's really three things here, right? And, and two of them um, have to do with, like, the Jewish law. Just so that the, he, He's basically just saying here, you know, I, I don't want you to uh, do your best to not offend the Jews, right? Like, like if, if, they, you know, if you're hanging out with them and, 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 and all of a sudden you start, like, eating, you know, this, this meat that's... that's uh, from strangled animals, you're probably going to offend them. You might want to stay away from that. You know, like, like um, the main thing he really speaks to here is like sexual immorality. Stay away from that, guys. Right? The gospel's simple. Right? It's really simple here. He says, he says it's all about grace. It's all about forgiveness. And like, like, don't be like the rest of the world when it comes to like your sexual life. Like, keep it pure. Keep it right. Keep it honoring to God. Religion will always look to major on minor issues. The simplicity of the gospel of Jesus is that we're only to major uh, on the major issues. Let me say that again. Religion will always look to major on minor issues. The simplicity of the gospel of Jesus is that we're only to major on the major issues. That's, that's what it is right there. And that's why you see, like, like you know, uh, I don't get involved in a lot of, like, political comments, you know. You, you see, you know, social media and things. You know, I, I, I just try to challenge you really on the things of God. If I throw something out there, I, I, I don't really, you know, t- take these, these strong stands on, you know, political things. I, I, now, I, I have developed thoughts, and I believe certain things, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm really more interested in majoring on major issues um, and, and really major spiritual issues. That's my arena, right? That's, that's really our arena. That's where we've got to make sure that that is healthy and, and alive and vibrant. Um, and, and like I said a couple weeks ago, sometimes we're, we're more, uh, more interested in defending our America than we are in defending our like, Christianity or our Jesus. Um, and so this is what's happening in this story, and I'm going I'm to close it down right here. But in, in verse 30, okay, so the messengers went at once to Antioch, right, this, this other hub for their faith, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter, right? The, the letter of, of what the expectations are. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message, right? Especially like amongst the men. Couldn't you, don't you think? Like truly. Especially. Thank you, God. It's only about forgiveness and only about grace. Tim, you got a minute to go. This is a like a major problem, um, just in the church altogether. It's something that that goes like unchecked sometimes, and it disguises itself. This issue of religion. Um, I mean. It's existed for a very, very long time. We start to get focused on issues of preference over issues of substance. We start to focus more on the outside of ourselves than the inside of ourselves. 
we start to, to reduce Christianity to a list of do's and don'ts. And, and the purity and the beauty of the gospel starts to just be polluted with poison. And, it's, it's, and, and the enemy actually starts to get his, his foot in the door and starts to, to create a church in his own image, a church that's filled with controversy and backbiting and struggle and expectations that, that Jesus doesn't even put on you. I want us to be a church that is more concerned with who we're reaching than with who we're keeping, okay? Now, I love you all. I wanna keep, I wanna keep you. I hope you stay. But there is, a, there is a time like never before for the church of Jesus Christ to be far more focused on who it is reaching than on who it is keeping. A church that wants to keep people focuses far too much energy on issues of preference and how to make everybody happy than it does on issues of substance. We're gonna be a church that's about the right things, okay? We're gonna exist for the right things and we're gonna focus our energy on who are we reaching. All of us with kingdom eyes, not just with organized ministry out of this church, but in your own personal life, in, in, in your day to day, when you're at work, when you're at the supermarket, when you are you know, in your community and in your neighborhood, do you have eyes to see people all around you who are unreached for the gospel of Jesus Christ? And, and we're going to be a church that's, that's far more interested in who we are reaching than who we are keeping. And, and that's, that is uh, the best way as your pastor that I could ever prepare you to be mature in your faith, to be strong in Jesus Christ, is to ask yourself, man, who are we reaching? Who doesn't know Jesus? Spiritual eyes to see the kingdom of God around you and, uh, and, and a bunch of people who desperately need this message. And we're going to always err on the side of grace as well. We're going to do our best to resist religion at all costs, right? We're going we're gonna to always err on the side of grace. I'd rather give, like, too much grace and then, like, rein it in if I have to than to not give enough away. I just, I just, I guess I pull that together from, you know, thinking about the amount of grace that Jesus has heaped on me and heaped on you. I mean, my life without the grace of Jesus Christ. Man. We're going to be a church where God is easy to find by swimming against the current of religion. The tendencies for us to embrace religion. Robert Capone, or Capone, uh, he says this. He says, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is the proclamation of the end of religion. Not of a new religion, or even the best of religions. If the cross is the sign of anything, it's the sign that God has gone out of the religion business and solved all of the world's problems without requiring a single human being to do a single religious thing. What the cross is actually a sign of is the fact that religion can't do a thing about the world's problems, that it never did work, and it never will. Come on. It's not about religion. This this isn't a religion. And time after time after time, the church has struggled with drifting towards focusing and emphasizing religion instead of emphasizing the, the importance of every single one of us developing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You gotta grow it. You gotta invest in your relationship with Jesus. I talked to this couple yesterday at their wedding, a couple from our church that got married yesterday, and I I said to them that they've gotta invest in in their relationship with Christ just as much as they they invest into their relationship with each other if they want a marriage that will last a lifetime. And and that's how it works. It's, It's simple, it's how it works. Like he either matters a lot to us or he doesn't. Let's be, a, let's be a church that rethinks this thing and makes sure we're about the right things, the right priorities. Maybe we start to make a difference in the lives of other people, people who aren't here yet, people who need to know more and more about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we love you today. Uh, God, I thank you that there is none like you. Man, I say that week and week and week uh, every, every single time. Uh, There's none like you, Father. God, I thank you for for what you are doing in this church. I thank you that there is something that is brewing in the belly of this church. God, I ask that you would wake up your church right now. 
God, for those of us maybe who have gone through the motions for far too long, Lord, would you just light a fire? God, would you just bless them with that? Would you just strike that match and light a fire in them today? Lord, would you just wake us up? Would you uh, breathe into us passion and hunger for the deep things of God? Passion and hunger to be the people that you've created and called us to be. Lord, would you wake up your church, not just here at New Point, but Lord, we, we, we just, God, we plead with you. Lord, we ask that, that, that the, the best days of the church would not be behind, but would be in front. Lord, we speak to that, we declare that, that the church has better days in front of it than it does behind it. We ask for a great awakening to sweep through the United States of America to circle this globe. Lord, where people who seem impossible to reach for the gospel would start to open their eyes and start to see a Jesus that is relentlessly pursuing them. God, let us play, play a part in that. God, would you let this church play a part in your plan to reach this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, I love you. Have an awesome week, guys.